Um, if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in Zephaniah. Zephaniah. We're getting towards the end of the Minor Prophets and getting close to getting into the New Testament soon. So, As you're turning to Zephaniah in your Bible, I'm just going to ask God's blessing our time in his word this morning. Uh, Father, thank you so much for uh, our time together so far. Um, yeah, just the way that um, you speak to us uh, through uh, prayer and through uh, music and now through your word. And then also how we can use those things to bring glory and worship to you. God, we just thank you we have uh, the relationship that we have with you, God. Uh, that we, we know that we have salvation. We have that security through what Christ has done for us. And uh, Jesus, you're, you're everything to us, God. Uh, we would be completely lost and helpless without you. And uh, I just pray that even this time in your word would be a, a time that you would draw us closer to you. And God, through your word and through your truth. And God, that we know is without error and has authority in our lives and um, just has an amazing power, and God, to, to change our life from the inside out and to make us more like Christ. And so we just pray you do your work, uh, Holy Spirit, in our lives this time. In Christ's name, amen. Well, I'm sure you've uh, had a scenario where somebody may have come to you and said, uh, I've got bad news and I've got good news. And the funny thing is, is when I came here this morning, I was talking to Elizabeth and I had some news to share with her. And I've got some, I said, I've got some bad news for you. So I shared the bad news and she goes, what's the good news? I said, I actually don't have any. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kind of left her hanging. But I will have some good news in the sermon today for you, Elizabeth. Um, but we've all had that scenario, right, where somebody comes and you're like, oh, great, there's some bad news, but hey, there's some good news, right? So it kind of evens out. Um, I remember, this is a while back, uh, my brother had just graduated from uh, the Air Force Academy from college, and uh, my parents were throwing a big party at our house uh, for him. We had family, and we had friends over. And you know how it is when you have a party at the house, it's hard to find places to park all the cars. And so I was kind of in charge of you know, rearranging the cars and parking them so we could fit a lot of people in the driveway. Um, well, my dad had just bought pretty much uh, maybe a year before that, really recently, um, a brand new uh, Corvette. Um, brand new, no scratches, nothing on it, r great condition. And so I had to make some room. And the funny thing is I've never told the story to him, and he might be watching this at some point. So sorry, Dad. Um, so anyway, I was, I was moving the car up, and um, I don't know if you've ever seen a Corvette or know what it looks like. The front end is super long. And it's always hard to tell where the, really the front end is. So I'm trying to itch it, you know, inch it closer to uh, where our deck was, where the stairs to the deck was. And I was like, oh, I'm good. Got out of the car, parked it, went in the house. Well, next thing I know is my uncle came with some bad news. He's like, Chad, you ran the Corvette into the deck. I was like, no way. There, I, it wasn't that close. He said, yeah, go look. And sure enough, I go out there, and the front end is all bent in. Just in, in him. So that was bad news, right? I was like, oh, man, what am I going to do? And um, so I was like, well, hopefully, maybe if I pull it back, those cars are pretty much made out of plastic. So hopefully it'll bend back, it'll pop back into place. <laughs> so I pull the car back, and sure enough, it pops back into place. No scratches, no dents. I'm glad that happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that's one of the scenarios where, you know, where you get the bad news, your heart drops, and you're like, oh, man, this is going to be a horrible situation. But then you get really good news, and you're like, okay, things are going to be good. Um, for you, maybe it was a car situation, something like that, but um, maybe you've experienced that at the doctor's office before. And uh, you went in, you're thinking, man, things aren't right, I'm not feeling great, and the doctor gives you some bad news. Maybe you have some kind of illness, maybe you have some kind of a, a spot that they found, or a cyst that they found, or something. Um, but then the doctor says, well, you know what, we do have a cure for this. We have medication for that, or you know, it's, it's not life-threatening, or whatever it may be. And so that might have happened to you at some point. Uh, maybe if you're still in school or you remember being back in school, uh, maybe you took a test and you got a test back and you didn't do so good on the test. You got some bad news that either failed or it was just a really bad grade. But it was close to the end of the semester and you realize, well, that didn't affect my grade so much that I'm not going to fail the class. I'm still going to pass. And so we all experience these, these scenarios, these dynamics of getting bad news and then getting good news. Well, human history is just that scenario. That's just human history. We all are, all, all are in a situation of bad news. Starting all the way back to Adam and Eve, where the bad news came into existence through their sin. Through their sin and through their choice, we've all been affected by the bad news. We've all been affected by sin and human depravity. 
But when it comes to God's plan of salvation, whether we like it or not, we have to hear the bad news first. Because some people, times, you know, people say you have a choice. You can hear the good news or the bad news, and you're like, oh, I'll hear the good news first. But in, in life, that's not the case. We have to the grasp the bad news of sin. We've got to grasp our condition before a holy God before we can hear the good news. And that's what the Bible is really about. I mean, really the, the first half of your Bible, what we've been going through, the Old Testament, is just that bad news over and over and over and over. If you read the Old Testament and you don't hear the message loud and clear that humanity is in trouble that we are completely lost without a, a plan of salvation uh, then you've missed something and really we need to hear that bad news because when we get to the good news it's really not that good unless we've heard the bad news first and maybe you've experienced this before in the sense that you maybe have told somebody like hey you know you just need to give your life to jesus you need to have him in your life and they're like well my life's good why would i need jesus i'm doing okay without him the problem is they haven't heard of what their condition is. They haven't heard anything about their sinful condition. And I would guess if they thought deep down inside, they already knew their condition, but maybe they've pushed it aside and pushed it down and have covered it up with other things and haven't really wrestled with that. But we have, we've got to get to the bad news before we can get to the good news. And um, that's what the prophets help us with. Time and time again, we see that they are a combination of this bad news, good news message. And Zephaniah is, is clearly one of these prophets that brought intense bad news, near bad news, and the far bad news that we're going to look at here in this book. Um, now, if you think about Zephaniah, I don't know if you had a chance to read that this, this week, uh, the book. Uh, but there's a little bit more about Zephaniah and who he was and his, his past than some of the other minor prophets uh, he traces his um, lineage back to Hezekiah, so he actually has royal ancestors. Um, and that's important because if you're a prophet, especially if you're speaking to a king, and you want that king to know that you have an important message, it helps to know that you have this lineage back to a former king. And basically, like, he's saying, we're family, you need to listen to me. He goes, my ancestors were kings of this nation. And he, this time he's talking to Josiah, and that's who was king at the time of the time that uh, Zephaniah wrote. And so he had a little more clout, he had a little more weight in his message because of that background. And he makes that clear right off the right off the bat, at the beginning of the, of the book. So again, Zephaniah wrote during the time of Josiah's reign. It dates the prophecy around 640 to 609 BC. Uh, at this point, when he's writing, the spiritual condition of Judah is still really bad. Moral conditions bad, society's really bad, uh, still a lot of wickedness, still a lot of idolatry going on. Um, if you know much about Josiah's reign, at one point he does bring a lot of revival and reformation to the country. But when Zephaniah is writing this, that hasn't happened yet. So in 628, Josiah tore down the altars to Baal. He burns the bones of false prophets and broke the carved idols. In 622 B.C., the book of the law was found, bringing about revival to Judah. Now, back when we were studying Josiah, and we talked about that situation where the book of the law was found. You can see how, what bad of shape they were in if they couldn't even find the book of the law, if it was lost somewhere, and somebody actually finds this. And it's true about the Israelites, true about Judah, but it's true about our own life. If you can't find your Bible, that's not a good sign. If you don't know where it is, that's not a good sign. It means you probably haven't been in it recently. Some of you guys leave your Bibles here after Sunday, and I'm wondering what you're doing all week without it. <laughs> some of you guys call, some of you don't. But we need to make sure that our, our, our Bibles are close, the Word of God is close. Um, because when it's not, we see what happened with Judah. They, they drifted far from God. Well, this time the world powers were transitioning from Assyrian to Babylonian. Up to this point, the Assyrians were the great empire of the time. We, we looked at that in previous Minor Prophets. Uh, Nahum specifically talks about Nineveh. Uh, but now this transition of power is going from Assyrian to Babylonian. And Zephaniah is writing right in the midst of this transfer of power. Um, Judah actually began to experience some independence during this time. 
Because when you have that power shift, you have really nobody, you know, watching the story, if you will, and no one really was watching over Judah because the Syrians were too worried about the Babylonians coming. And so uh, Israel had a little bit of time of independence, and that's probably why they had a revival and some good things were happening. But prior to this, and prior to Josiah, there was 55 years of just wicked kings in Judah. And so Josiah brings about this revival to the land. But at the end of the day, it was too little too late for Judah. God had already made his plans. Judgment was already coming. He had already decided to pour out his wrath on them for their sin. And so Judah would eventually be conquered by the Babylonians and Jerusalem would be destroyed. So that's the cultural context, the historical context that we're in the middle of right now as Zephaniah is writing this prophecy. Um, if you're a note taker, it's a really easy outline for the book of Zephaniah. Two main points. The first point, bad news. Bad news, right? The judgment, the curse of God. And we'll see who he judges and who he curses. The second main point is going to be the good news, the blessings of the Lord. Uh, the bad news comes through chapter 1, all the way through to chapter 3, verse 8, majority of the book. Last portion of chapter uh, 3, nine through, uh, verses 9 through 20, is the good news. So we'll start with the bad news, uh, the Lord's judgment for sin. He starts off by talking about judgment on the whole earth, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And this is what was called the far fulfillment of the day of the Lord. You may have heard that term before, the day of the Lord. You see that throughout the Bible. Um, you might not know what that is. In some situations, it's a specific time period. In other situations, it's, a, um, it's just an understanding of the pouring out of God's wrath um, on people, on nations, on the world. And so at times in the past, there were specific days of the Lord that the prophets talk about. But in the end times, uh, after Christ returns, there's going to be a final outpouring of his wrath, a final judgment on all the earth. And he talks about this. He says he'll sweep away everything from the face of the earth. He says he's going to sweep away man and beast. So there's going to be this complete judgment on the earth in the future. And so Zephaniah talks about that a little bit right at the beginning. Then he starts shifting over to a specific group of people of Judah, his judgment on Judah. Chapter 1, verses 4 through chapter 2, 3. And this is what he says to them. Verse 4, he says, He will stretch out his hand against Judah, against all who live in Jerusalem. Why was he going to stretch out his hand against them? Well, this is what they were doing. He says, Those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host. Astrology, basically what that was. They were worshiping the stars. They were trying to get their understanding of the future and what, you know, what was going to happen in their life by setting these, these altars on their they would have flat roofs, so it would look a little different than our roofs. So they would go up to these roofs, and they'd worship at night to the stars. And say, so the Israelites, the Judea, uh, those of Judah were doing this. It says, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, but also those who swear to Molech. So they were mixing their worship with God and their worship with other idol gods. It says, those who turn back from the following the Lord, and those who neither seek him nor inquire of him. So these are the people that we see in Judah right now in this, in this situation. And I think for God, what was worse than forsaking him completely and worshiping these other gods was this mixture of worshiping other gods and worshiping the one true God. I mean, you can imagine the, the anger and the wrath that built up in God when he saw his people mixing the two together. When they weren't wholeheartedly just fully worshiping him alone like he had called them to do, to worship him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was one of their greatest verses in their scripture was to worship him that way. And they had mixed him in with all the other, other gods. Well, I think people do this today too. Don't we or don't people do that today? We kind of hedge our bets a little bit. And I'm hoping that's not most of us, but I think there are Christians out there who do this. Well, I'll do church on Sunday then I'll do kind of the world a little bit during the week. Maybe I'll look at astrology a little bit to kind of see what that has to say. You know, maybe I'll go to a self-help book and see what they have to say about life and kind of get all our bases covered. That's really what they were doing. They were trying to cover all their bases by worshiping the God of the Bible and worshiping these idols and worshiping the stars. 
just in case. They could be wrong in one area. Maybe the other area would be powerful in their life. And you can see how jealous God was for them, how, how much he desired for them to just forsake all other guys and worship him alone. You know, so, you know, a good example is this idea of astrology. That's not, I mean, that's not gone away. And if you're, you know, if you're into astrology, if you're into this stuff, that is idol worship. You know, people are like, oh, it's just fun, right? It's just, you know, I'm just interested. I just, you know, read the horoscopes in the paper. It's idol worship. It's abominable to God. The other things they were doing is that it says they were swearing to Molech. They were worshiping this other idol god. And part of that worship to, these other, uh, to Molech was to sacrifice children. I mean, how bad could it get when people were doing that? How heinous and wicked had they come when they were sacrificing their children to Molech? Again, astrology was part of that. Temple prostitution was part of that. And so we are getting to the, the depths and the depths of depravity in Judah at this time. With God, it's all or nothing. We can't mix other things with our worship to him. In verse 7, we see the near fulfillment of the day of the Lord. He says, be silent. Before the sovereign Lord. For the day of the Lord is near. So he's saying this, this, this time of judgment, this time of, of wrath is coming and it's coming soon. In their case, he was prophesying about the coming of the Babylonians. Like I said, they, they weren't quite in power yet. There's this transition. But God had informed him, informed other prophets that the Babylonians would be the next great power. And they would be the ones that would come in and destroy Judah, destroy Jerusalem. And so Zephaniah goes through the, to the extreme of saying, in God's eyes, there will no longer be sacrifice of animals, but God's going to sacrifice you. He's going to put you on the altar. Because if you're not going to sacrifice to him, if you're not going to worship him alone, then he is going to sacrifice you. And that's how seriously uh, God takes uh, his holiness and his sovereignty and the worship of him. It says in, the, in Zephaniah that God's going to judge them to the point that there's going to be cries and wailing from all over Jerusalem. Nobody was going to be spared from this judgment. Nobody was going to be spared from the wrath of God. He even says that in verse 12 that God would punish those who were complacent. Basically, there might have been those who were maybe participating in the worship seriously with these idol gods. But they were sitting back and doing nothing about it. They were just sitting back and going, well, it's not my problem. It's not my issue. You know, let God deal with them. And God says, no, you're just as, as guilty because you're letting this happen. You're not doing anything about it. You're not going to your neighbor. You're not going to your leaders. You're not challenging them in what they are doing. And so nobody was going to escape it. He says it's like wine left in its dregs. I don't know much about how wine is, is made and produced, but I looked into this a little bit and what is this whole dregs thing? What's the dregs of wine? So when wine is produced, even in the process, in the barrels and such, the impurities, what's left over from the grapes sinks to the bottom, the heavy stuff drinks to the bottom. And that's the stuff that you're not supposed to eat or drink. It's not really supposed to be part of um, your consumption. Um, and it sometimes will happen in the bottle of wine too. You'll have the sediment at the bottom. And uh, it's, it's the impurity in the wine. And the problem is, when you're making wine, from my research, if you leave that too long, if you leave the wine in its dregs, it actually will ruin the whole barrel, it'll ruin a whole bunch of wine. And you've heard the, the term dregs of society? That's where it comes from. It's this idea that a certain group of people can spoil the whole bunch. A certain group of people can corrupt the whole bunch. And that's what he's saying about Judah. He said, there's been people in your midst, whether it's the leaders, it's the officials, whether it's the top all the way down, you have these people who have been spoiling the whole country. And he says, I've got to bring judgment because the whole country has been ruined, has been defiled. Where may is this, maybe has this happened in our lives? Where has we left sin undealt with in our personal lives? Where have we left sin undealt with in our marriages, in our families? Maybe sometimes in the church body. And that's why God says in the New Testament how seriously that is to make sure we're dealing with that appropriately. Um, I don't have to tell you where that's happened in our country where we've said, you know what, we're going to kick God out and we're just going to let things fester to the point where it is right now. 
Uh, if sin isn't dealt with, it's going to multiply. It's going to take over. It's going to assume our lives. It consumes our relationships. consumes our marriages and our families and our country or society. So the dregs have to, got to be dealt with. It's got to be removed from the barrel of wine. Zephaniah lists what the day of the Lord will entail. If you have your Bibles, verse 15 talks a lot about this in detail. It says it will be a day of wrath. It says it will be a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble, of ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpets, uh, the sound of battle cries against fortified cities. There will be so much distress that people will grope about like they're blind. And says all this is because of their sin against God. He said blood will be poured out like the dust. He says the entrails will be poured out like dung. It's a pretty graphic description of what that day of the Lord will look like at that time. And he says, and guess what? He says, it doesn't matter if you have a lot of gold. doesn't matter if you have a lot of silver. You're not going to buy your way out of this. Your wealth is not going to save you from this. I think we see that in, in a great way in our day and age. Some people are like, I don't need God, I don't need church, because I've got my money. I can buy my way out of anything. Any trouble I face, I'll just buy my way out of it. You know, if I'm depressed, I'll just entertain myself. If I have health issues, I'll just, you know, go to the greatest doctor, and hopefully they can help me in this situation. You know, if my kids are a problem, I'll just pay them off with stuff. But Zephaniah says, when it comes to the day of the Lord, it doesn't matter. The rich, the poor, everybody's going to experience the day of the Lord, because nobody is safe. He says, in the future fulfillment of the day of the Lord, he says, the whole earth will be consumed by fire. God will make a sudden end to all who live on the earth. It kind of reminds us of the flood, right? Where he got to the place and says, I am done with these people. I am done with everything I've created. And he wipes out the whole place except for one family. That similar kind of thing is going to happen again. Instead of saving the family of, of Noah, he's going to save the believer. He's going to save those who are followers of Christ. Everybody else who is still living will be affected by this great devastation of fire. So I promise you, you want to be in the loving arms of Jesus when this happens. Whether you die before that happens and you face the judgment of God, or whether you're still alive when that happens, you want to be in the protective, loving arms of Jesus. Because he is the only one who's going to protect you from God's wrath. I mean, think about the detail and the explanation of what we see in Zephaniah and what I've been explaining to you of how horrific that time is. Can you imagine anything else that could save you from that kind of judgment and wrath? I mean, leaders and politicians can't even save us from our current situation. You know, human beings don't have answers. Organizations don't have answers. Government doesn't have answers. The only thing that can save us from that kind of wrath and devastation is the loving, protective arms of Jesus. You want to be there when this time comes. In chapter 2, verse 1, he encourages the people of Judah to do just that, to seek the Lord. He says, seek righteousness and humility and just like in Judah's day, the people thought, well, you know what? I can throw God a bone every now and then, and I'm good. And, but there was so much pride. They thought they had it all figured out. They thought they had a system that they could appease all the gods, and they would be okay. And Zephaniah says, no, it's only going to be those who humble themselves. It's only those who seek after righteousness. And we see this in the Beatitudes as well. He says, the poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom of God. It's only those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that will be filled. We've talked in previous books of, of the danger of pride and how it's the most dangerous of all sins. It's, it's what is like the, the, the soil of sin. It's what, what, what grows sin in our life is this idea of pride. And that was Judah's greatest sin. And it was what Zephaniah was trying to warn them against. So, so far in the book of Zephaniah, we have the judgment on all the earth. We have the judgment on Judah. And now Zephaniah talks about the judgment on the nations. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. And basically what he's going to say, he goes, nobody's getting off the hook here. Nobody in the world, doesn't matter if you're in Judah, 
doesn't matter if you're a Gentile, everybody is under sin. We see that in Romans. It says, even though the Gentiles did not have a law, they had a law on their hearts. I hear this a lot when it comes to the gospel and Jesus and Christianity. And people say, well, what about people who've never gone to church? How do they know? You know, what about people who don't have Christian parents? Is that fair that the gospel's on the way and they didn't get brought up that way? What's, why is it, is it fair that people who live in other countries who might be brought up in another religious system? The Bible says that no one is going to be without excuse because the law was written on our hearts. He's given us a conscience to know that there is a one true God and that we've sinned against him. When people swear and they use God's name in vain, they know they're sinning. That's why they use God's name in vain on purpose to know that they are in a way sounding like, you know, sinning against God. They don't use Buddha. They don't use other gods, right? They use the God of the Bible as the way they use it in vain. People know that when they abuse God's gift of sex by doing it outside of marriage in a way it wasn't intended, they know that sin because their conscience tells them it is. Can you do it enough? Can you repress that to the point where you don't hear your conscience anymore? You don't hear God's voice anymore? Absolutely, that can happen. But people know when they sin that it's wrong. People know when they lie or when they're deceitful or when they steal that it's sin because it's written on their hearts. People know that lust is sin. People know that anger is sin. People just know that because it was written on our hearts. That's an internal law that God's given every person. And Zephaniah is saying this to the, the other nations. He says, you're not getting off the hook just because you're not a Jew, just because you didn't have the written law, just because you didn't have the prophets. He's going to call out all the nations that had their day of worldly success and power. And he names some of these nations. Um, he says, Philistia, who were the Philistines. We've heard a lot about them in the Old Testament, right? Talks about Moab and Ammon and and Cush in Assyria, um, he tells Philistia, he says, I'm going to wipe you out, and I'm going to take your land, I'm going to give it to Israel after the exile, after they return. I don't need a Bible to know a lot about God's plan. I got to look at a map. I can just look at a globe and know that God's plan is true, and the prophets are true. All I have to do is look at the Middle East, and I know the prophets were right on. Do you know of a, a, a country of the Philistines? doesn't exist anymore, does it? They're gone. They've been wiped out, just like Zephaniah says. Guess who has their land right now? The Jews. Because he says, I'm going to give it to them. And they're going to be enriched by it. And I'm going to bless them by it. So we literally see before our very eyes the fulfillment of, of Zephaniah's uh, prophecy here. And so I think it's going to be even more fulfilled in the end times when there's going to be more of a revival in Israel talks about Moab and Ammon. Uh, he said they're going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what happened to them because their sin, they were wiped out. This is the same thing that happened to Moab, Ammon. Those countries don't exist anymore. Those people groups, for the most part, are no longer. He says they're going to be a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. Um, Cush doesn't say a whole lot about them, but he says that uh, they will be slain by God's sword, uh, sword. The Syrians, we know a little bit about them, right? Nineveh. Supposedly one of the greatest cities ever built, one of the most fortified cities ever built. He says, uh, the people of Nineveh said, I am the one and there is none beside me. Where is Nineveh now? It's this kind of broken down, destroyed city of Mosul in, in Iraq. Not much of a great city anymore. It's been gone. As great as they thought it was to God, it was all just matchsticks that he could just destroy at will. Verse 13 says, He'll leave Nineveh utterly desolated, a dry desert. Verse 15, all who pass by her scoff and shake their fist. Last group that Zephaniah talks about as far as judgment is he now zeroes in on Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why is he picking on Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was the spiritual hub of the Jews, of Judah, and at one point the whole nation. So what happened in Jerusalem affected the whole nation. What the leaders did and the leadership of Jerusalem affected the whole nation. 
And he says because of the importance of that city and how they had misled the nation, there would be great judgment on Jerusalem. Zephaniah takes great pains to list the sins of Jerusalem. He basically says they had no excuse. He says they were oppressors, they were rebellious, they were defiled. They didn't accept correction, did not trust God, didn't, did not draw near to God. The leaders consumed everything for themselves. He said they were like lions and wolves who just kind of grabbed on the prey and just took it for themselves and devoured it. He says the prophets were unprincipled, the priests were profane, or profane the sanctuary. Jerusalem is where God has set up his earthly presence on earth. He had him build a temple, and that's where his glory resided. And they were worshiping other gods in the temple. They were bringing idols into the temple. And you see how angry God must have been because of this. And in Zephaniah, says, in contrast, God has always stayed faithful. He's always been righteous. He says, you guys have changed. God hasn't. God has always been the same. He's always stayed faithful. He's always stayed righteous. It's you who has drifted off. So uh, Jerusalem remained unrepentant, even though God had expressed his righteousness and his judgment on the nations all around them. They had already seen it. They had already seen the wrath of God and the judgment of God poured out. They saw it in Israel. They saw it in other nations, Gentile nations, yet they weren't willing to repent. For, uh, chapter 3, verse 7 says, but they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. So Zephaniah says uh, that after his patience, God would unleash all his fierce anger. So this happened very specifically in Jerusalem uh, in 597 BC, and it will happen at a great scale in the future. In chapter 3, verse 8, it says the whole world would be consumed by fire because of God's jealous anger. I don't want to be on the wrong side of that kind of anger and that kind of jealousy. Um, we have no excuses. God's given us the bad news. He's given us the clear future of what God's going to do because of sin. And so if you're here this morning, you've heard it. You've heard the bad news. So you guys ready for the good news now? Because that's a lot of bad news. That's pretty horrific. So let's see what God says about the good news in Zephaniah. He first talks about the good news to the nations, chapter 3, 9 through 10. Verse 9, he says, he will purify the lips of the peoples. So when he talks about the peoples, he's not talking about his people, the Jews. He's talking about all the nations. He says, these are all the saved people from all nations, from all of history. He says, they will worship God altogether. He says, they will serve God shoulder to shoulder. This is a great picture of the unified worship of the church. I mean, right now, it's Sunday morning. We're worshiping here. People are worshiping in other cities. There's different denominations. People are worshiping in different tongues, different worship styles, different theologies. But he says the good news is that we're all going to worship God shoulder to shoulder, together with one voice. It's almost hard to imagine that, right? The, the way Christianity is so subdivided, it's hard to imagine that we're all going to understand God perfectly in, in unity and a perfect one voice of worship. But that's good news that that's going to happen. And Zephaniah reminds us of that. Then he says that there's good news for Judah. Chapter 3, verses 11 through 20. He says, at the end, Judah will not be put to shame for the wrong done to God. He still has a plan for them. There's different ways of understanding God's ultimate plan for Israel. Some feel that his plan for Israel is kind of done, and then he's just incorporated them into the broader church. But as I read the prophets, it seems like there is a future specific plan for the ethnic Jews, for Judah. And there is going to be a revival, I believe, in Israel. I don't think he established that, that nation the way it is and has that remnant for nothing. I think there is going to be a revival amongst the Jews at the end times. And I think that's what Zephaniah is talking about here. But for right now, there is only a remnant of the Jews. Uh, just a small percentage of Jews are true followers of Jesus. Um, there was actually more Jewish believers in the years after Jesus in 
the region of Israel than there is now. Isn't that crazy to think? 2,000 years later, the number of Jewish believers has shrunk and not grown. Um, as we know from the New Testament, it exploded in that region, but since then it has, has really dwindled. And we see that in the New Testament. He says only a remnant. He's only going to you know, save that small remnant of Jews until the end time. But the good news is there will be a revival, I believe, is what he's saying here in the end time. Uh, he says during that time, we see in chapter 3, uh, there's great encouragement to those who are faithfully following God. He says in the, in the future, he says no one will do wrong. There will be no lies. There will be no deceit. They'll find rest and protection. The true believers in God will sing. They'll shout. They'll rejoice with all their hearts. God will take away their punishment, remove them from their enemies, and they will no longer fear harm. Verse 17 says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I never thought about that as, I know we're going to do singing, but it says that God's going to rejoice over us with singing because of his love. I mean, can you imagine that voice? That's going to be amazing to hear the voice of God singing over his people who is a mighty warrior who saves. Just take a little bit of time just to just let that sink in of, of who God is. And it says, because of his love, he will no longer rebuke us. Well, Zephaniah continues to give us good news. He says, God will remove sorrow. He will remove all oppressors. He will re uh, rescue the lame. He will gather the exiles. And he says, he will give them praise and honor. He will bring all true believers home. And give honor and praise among the people of the earth. That's what we have to look forward to. I know it's hard to sometimes live as a believer right now because it's just, you don't sense that. But that's God's promise. Well, what is great about the time that we live in is that we have the full counsel of God. Right? We have the Bible, Genesis through Revelation, all that God intended to tell us. In that time... They only had the law and the prophets. So they only knew a little bit about what God had for them in the future. We know all of it. They had a lot of bad news, a little bit of good news, but we have all of the bad news and all of the good news in our time. So in the New Testament, the inspired authors go into great detail of what the good news is. I love Romans because it is probably the most concise understanding of the good news of the gospel from start to finish what it is, how it affects our lives, how it should affect the church. And uh, what we see in Romans is that all have been affected by sin. Again, Gentiles aren't safe. Religious people aren't safe. Jews aren't safe because they're born Jewish. He said all are under sin. Romans 3, 9, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we all are so... For we have already made the ch uh, charge that Jews and ch Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Everybody needs to hear the bad news. They need to understand that that's where they start in life. But there can be a change. There can be salvation. There is good news. And what I like about Paul, even though he goes into more detail about the gospel and more detail about the theology around the gospel and how to trust and believe in the gospel from the beginning of chapter three he doesn't even end the chapter and there wasn't chapters back then but we understand it that way he already gets to the good news by the end of chapter three and this is what he says in verses 21 through 26 just try to take this in for a moment because this is the best news that you'll ever hear or ever have heard but now apart from the law the righteousness of god has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. He says, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Just to let you know, on a side note, when he says all have been justified, he's talking about all those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So that's what he talked about previously. It's not all people. 25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. 
to, re- to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. If you ask how to be saved, it's pretty clear right there. Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Biblical faith isn't just crossing your fingers and hoping that's true. Biblical faith is leaning your whole life, your whole being onto Jesus and saying, it's either this or nothing. I'm not going to hedge my bets. I'm not going to hope it's maybe something else besides Jesus. It's saying I'm all in with Jesus. And I trust 100% that what he did on the cross was sufficient to save me from my sins, was sufficient to pay the penalty for my sin. And a saving faith, it talks about James, a saving faith means that life will change. It has to change. If you say, I have trust in Jesus and there is no life change, then something was amiss there in your understanding of what faith is. Because when you trust Jesus at that moment, he puts the Holy Spirit in you and promises that the Holy Spirit will do that work. He'll complete what he has started through the Holy Spirit, and there will be change. Over time, you will look more and more like Christ. You will live more and more like the way that he wants you to live. It's a lifelong journey. It doesn't happen at the beginning, and we're really not done until we're completely glorified at the end. But there will be a progression in our life if we're truly saved by faith. I love it when the, when the text and the passage just leads us right into communion. Because that's what this represents. That's what we're about to do this morning in communion. It represents the good news. It represents everything that, that Paul just talked about. It's a reminder that we are justified freely by grace. A reminder that redemption came by Christ Jesus. It's a reminder that Christ was the sacrifice of the atonement. What does atonement mean? That means that our sins were dealt with. That something happened that God didn't have to punish us for. His wrath was satisfied. His judgment was satisfied. And so when we take communion, we're saying that that was true. That the blood of Christ, his shed blood, was enough to satisfy the anger and the wrath of God towards me and you. And ultimately, it's a reminder that we are saved by grace through faith. So communion is something to be taken very seriously. Uh, Paul talks about that in um, 2 Corinthians. And it's something to uh, only be for believers. Um, Why would it only be for believers? I think some churches just, uh, you know, everybody takes it. Because when you're taking it, you're saying something about what you believe. You're, you're saying something about what has already happened in your life. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, how could you say that what these elements represent have happened to you if they haven't happened yet? And even worse, Paul says, you're bringing more condemnation on yourself if you're taking it in an unworthy manner. And so it's not our way of saying, you know, we want certain people to take it and not other people to take it. It's not like divide people. We just want to take it in a, in a worthy manner. It's also a good time to be reminded that that forgiveness is offered through Christ. That when we become a believer and we put our faith in Jesus Christ in an eternal sense, he forgives us all of our sins, but we're also being forgiven along the way. And we aren't even conscious of all of our sins from day to day or hour to hour. And so that doesn't mean you got to kind of like rack your brain to think of every minute sin that you could have committed and, and confess it to God before you take communion. But it's just a time of recognizing that you are sinful. And we are still sinful. And just kind of lay that before God. And saying, God, you know, show me that path of righteousness. Seek me and know me. Know all those wicked ways in me. And, and, and forgive me and put me in a right place before you. Before I take communion. So let's take some time this morning to do that. Give the Holy uh, Spirit some time to just do some work in our hearts and our minds. Uh, before we go to the Lord's table.